Okay, welcome to gender and image. As you can probably tell, we may not make it to the third week because we don't have enough students. But I encourage you to come next week anyway, because next week will be a movie. Will I, will I? Like, it's a movie. You don't want to miss that. Um, so in this class, uh, I'm going to give you the basic introduction this week. Yeah, let's look at the syllabus. First week, introduction to the course, gender issues and feminist film theory. Um, feminism also includes men, so don't worry about that. Then every two weeks will be one unit. We're going to watch a movie together. And then the following week, or I should say, as we're watching the movie, I will be writing some discussion questions. And I will upload the discussion questions to Moodle after class. And the following week, um, I was planning on dividing you into small groups, and each small group would give a presentation answering those questions. If we do manage to make it to week three and we have, let's say, 25 to 30 students, um, there will be a total of seven presentations. The first one, I will give the presentation to let you see what it looks like. So if we have, say, 25 to 30 students, each group will have between three to four people or maybe between four to five people. Um, so each group will, yeah. So on week two, we'll watch the movie. Week three, I will give the presentation. And then after my presentation, I will divide, if we make it to week three, I will divide you into your small groups and you will choose one week. Now, you'll notice, starting from the third film, I don't tell you what the film is. Um, so you'll have to watch closely. There's a trade-off here. If your group chooses to do presentation two, the disadvantage is that you will be the first one, right? Very scary to be the first group. But the advantage is that you know the movie. So you don't have to wait for us to watch it in class. You can do some background reading. You can do a little more preparation. Um, but the rest of the films are a surprise. Now, the discussion questions will all be open-ended questions. I'm not going to ask uh, which actor played this character or when did this person say this thing? Or did this actually happen in history? Boring questions. I'm going to ask you open-ended questions like, why do you think she did this? Or do you think this person is a good role model? Open-ended questions that do not have one correct answer. Now, the whole of week five, week seven, et cetera, will be discussing those questions or listening to your group get, share your answers. So you will have a lot of time on stage. I encourage you to give more than one answer for each question and to try your best to give a complete explanation of your answer or answers you probably will not use two hours. So in the rest of the time, I will come up here and discuss your presentation. So like you guys answered this way, you gave these reasons, and I might say, yes, this makes a lot of sense. We can also think about this question a different way, and I'll give you even more ideas to think about. The presentation scores will be your final exam score. 
we will not have a final exam. These presentations are your final exam. We will have a midterm exam. The midterm exam will also be an open ended question. So there's more than one right answer. It will be an essay question. I'll ask you a big open question. It will be a take home. Open book, open ended essay question. You will have one week to answer the question. Let me show you. I'm not going to show you the question. I'm going to show you what the exam looks like. Uh, so. During class, I will show you the question. I will explain the question and then starting from after class, you can go on to Moodle and begin answering and your deadline will be seven days later midnight. You will have one week to think about it, to look up materials if you want to and to do your best to answer the essay question. Now, this class is taught in English. So your answer should be in English. It says here. Yes. It will be completely open ended, but this point says. You must give at least four pieces of specific and accurate evidence from your chosen film or films that we have screened in class to explain your answer. So you can use examples from other movies, but you must use at least four examples. I, I can't do four, but four examples from the movies that we have seen before the midterm. And by sheer coincidence, before the midterm, you will have seen four movies. So you will you can use uh, you must give at least four pieces of evidence from some, at least one of these four movies. You can use one movie, you can use two movies, you can use all four movies. OK, right. So it's not just like sleep through the first eight weeks and then look things up online, right? I want you to connect your answer with what we watch and discuss in class. Now, some of you might be thinking, this teacher is so stupid. Doesn't he know we now have chat GPT? And yes, I do know this. So I have designed a few uh, rules to encourage you not to use chat GPT. One is the specific evidence rule. The other one is you must write an English essay with multiple non itemized paragraphs. It must have more than one paragraph. And it cannot be itemized, so don't give me a list. Don't give me section titles. Just give me paragraph, 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 paragraph. Um, now, if you want to, I said this is open book, so you can use information. From other sources, but if you do, please tell me what your source is. And don't just give me a list of sources at the end of your answer. Please tell me for each piece of information, where did you get it? So blah, 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 and then parentheses, gua hao source parentheses so that sentence is taken from this place okay i'll remind you of this before the midterm exam but this is what the midterm kind of will look like so that you are prepared the idea is that every week we watch a movie we discuss a movie and those ideas will help you prepare to answer this big exam question Um, so this is a general education course. I don't want to be too strict on you. So the midterm exam is 20%. The final presentation 
which is just your presentation, is 20%, and attendance is 60%. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Okay. Which means, like, as long as you come to class and pay attention, you're probably going to pass. But if you want the grade to look better on your transcript, you should do the work. Okay. Uh, right. So uh, on Moodle, what else do we have? Uh, syllabus class emails. If I send you a message through Moodle, there will be a record here. Gender and image. This is the PowerPoint I will be talking about later. Lecture recordings. I'm recording this and in the future, all lectures. Um, not your presentations. I'm not going to record your presentations. Don't worry. Uh, I will record my lectures and my response to your presentation. Now, uh, one good thing about putting lectures on YouTube is you can search the transcript. Okay, so YouTube will generate a, a, a written transcript of the video, and you can use Control F or Command F to search that transcript. And this video shows you how. Um, okay, this is where I will input your presentation grades. Uh, this is where I will input your attendance grades. You can't see this. I have hidden this from you. Attendance is very simple. If you miss class and you don't take leave, I will take away, uh, okay, total 60 points, right? I will take away 10 points uh, for one week of uh, leave without absence. Uh, that translates to about 15% out of 100. Is that right? That can't be right. The math doesn't add up. Uh, no, no, sorry. Six points. I will take away six out of 60 points uh, for every week that you are absent without leave. That is 15. Hmm, that's not 15%. Anyway, six points is correct. I'm going to take away six points. The percentage I'll figure out later. Uh, and then finally, you shouldn't have a problem passing this course, but if you do have a problem passing this course, uh, after the final week, after week 18, you can come and take the last chance quiz. What is the last chance quiz? Well, if you need it, you will find out. And if you do a good job, I'll let you pass. Now, if you do pass, but you think your score looks very bad and you want a higher score, you can do the extra credit assignment. Um, this is not easy. I'm giving you extra points. It can't be too easy. Um, and I will ask you to submit a word file, docx or doc, uh, and there will be a minimum word count. So you should be careful if you use Google Docs. If you use Google Docs and then turn it into a Word file, you might have this problem. Can you see what's wrong with this picture? How many words are selected? Two, right? But the computer says five words. And then, like some of these words are cut off in the middle, right? What is that S? And then the third line looks like the second half of expectations. Why does the computer do this? This is because the computer thinks that each letter is a word. So because there is a minimum word count of 2000 English words, if you have this problem, and the computer tells you you already have 2,000 words. No, you actually only have 2,000 letters. So if you use Google Docs and you turn it into a Microsoft Word file and you notice that some words have been cut off in the middle, you might have a problem. How do you solve this problem? You have to copy everything, paste it into 
something that is not Microsoft. So you can paste it into like a blogging website or you can paste it into Notepad or something. And then you copy that, open a new Microsoft Word file and paste it there. That's the only way to solve this problem. Hopefully uh, you do not run into this issue. If you do, uh, that's how to solve it. If you forget how to solve it, I'm recording this so you can watch it back again. And if you still can't remember, you can come talk to me. Okay, and that's the course design. Do you have questions? Okay, so uh, let's talk about gender and image. So I'm going to talk about three big ideas here. The basic concepts, what is gender and sex and sexual orientation? The second big concept is about feminism. This word is being misused everywhere online. So I want to show you what feminism really means and how it can help both, not both, it can, it can help women, men, and everybody else. And then we're going to connect these ideas to films and film theory. So what is biological sex? The basic idea is about sexual characteristics of the human body. But is it that simple? Is everybody either female or male? Some of you might know that some people are born with some characteristics of female and male bodies. And those people are called intersex. So should the relationship kind of look like this? On the one side, you have female bodies. On the other side, you have male bodies. And in between, you have intersex bodies. Or should it look more like this? Because intersex bodies have characteristics of both female and male bodies, they kind of take up the middle space. That seems to make more sense, right? But we're missing one more thing. Okay, the next slide is kind of scary. Don't be scared. That's a warning. I know you can't see this. I'm talking about, where is it? Here, absent or limited pubertal development. In other words, in other words, some intersex people do not have sexual characteristics. So it's not just some parts of the female body, some parts of the male body. It's also sometimes no parts of the female or male body. Okay, so this very scary picture is taken from Scientific American, uh, and it's a chart explaining all the different kinds of intersex bodies, how they become intersex, like in the process of being born, what happens to the body to make them intersex? What consequences are there for these different types of bodies? And if the person wants to change their bodies, how they can change it? So it's just one big, massive chart. On the one side, these are typical biological females. On the other side, typical biological males. And then in the middle are all the different kinds of intersex people that have been observed. Uh, at the top is conception. So when uh, the mother or the, the female body becomes pregnant, in the middle is birth. So after the fetus is born and becomes a baby, what do the doctors see? And then here is puberty, when a typical body 
gains secondary sexual characteristics, what happens to different kinds of intersex bodies? Yeah, so I know you can't see the details, but you can download the PowerPoint and like download this file and like make it bigger to, to read if you're interested. So that's biological sex. It's not just male, female. There are all different kinds of situations uh, in between and aside from female and male. Now, if you think biological sex is complicated, wait until we talk about gender. If biological sex is the physical body, gender is the sense of identity in society. In Chinese, we translate this as bie. The idea is every society has ideas about what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman. Very few people will, for example, look at a list of what it means to be a woman and agree with every single point. Same thing for men, right? Men are this, men are that. Very few people will say yes to everything. But between all yes men and all yes women, there is a huge space in the middle. And that space is what we're talking about when we talk about gender. So it's not just woman or man. Some people disagree with most items in the men list and most items in the women list. So for people who don't feel like they should be considered women or men, these people are called non-binary. Binary means two. So they are neither of the two. So is gender just like this? On the one side, women. On the other side, men. In the middle, non-binary. It's not that simple, right? What about this? Top left is woman, top right is man, and the third side of the triangle is other or non-binary. But then some people don't feel like they have any, uh, they don't feel like any of the gender descriptions fit them even for non-binary descriptions. If I gave you a list of uh, how to describe non-binary people, some people will look at this list and also say no to many of these items. Uh, and so there is a scale of how strongly you feel like you belong to a certain kind of gender. So already the triangle is a scale, right? More towards the woman's side, more towards the man side or more towards the non-binary side. But you can also have a scale of intensity, how strongly do you agree that these gender characteristics describe you? But is that the whole picture of gender? What about this? Okay, think about this picture as the previous picture, but you're looking at it from the top. So again, one side is man, uh, one corner is man, another corner is woman, the top corner is other or non-binary, and then if you go down, the further down you go, the less strong you feel about your gender. But this picture has one additional element here. Uh, where's my mouse? Here. Pangender. Pangender is the opposite of agender. Agender means uh, you don't feel like these gender characteristics describe you. Pangender means you feel like all of these gender characteristics describe you. So pangender people, when you give them a list of uh, things describing men, a list describing women, and a list describing non-binary people, pangender people will say yes to most of these items on all three lists. 
So yeah, gender can be a very complicated subject. Um, believe it or not, this is a very simple version of like if you I, I was doing research for this PowerPoint and there are some very complicated pictures about gender. I tried to find the simpler ones to help you understand. Now, these ideas apply to all humans. Like logically speaking, I think we've covered all of the logical positions. But it's OK if you yourself have not thought a lot about your own gender. Um, there should not be a pressure on people to find the exact point on this chart that you belong to. It's OK if you don't really care. The point is that some people do care a lot, and so we should understand why they care, and we should respect the gender that they believe they are. Like The way they present themselves in society is something that we should respect. So not just man or woman, there are many different possibilities. Now we've been talking about biological sex and about gender. What if we put them together? Uh, and this is the question of pronouns. Uh, the question of pronouns is more complicated in English than in Chinese. Chinese doesn't have so many pronouns, uh, but in English we have some options. Usually we use pronouns to talk about somebody's gender, not about their body, about how they feel like they belong in society. Now, if, uh, sorry, the first one, um, you don't have to limit yourself to one set of pronouns. I know people who use she, her pronouns and they, them pronouns. Uh, they don't just accept either one. They welcome people to use both, depending on context or depending on feeling. So you don't have to only use one set of pronouns. Now, if your gender, the pronouns that you use, fit or at least don't conflict with your biological body, then you are cisgender. Cis means same, on the same side as. So a person whose body is female and feels like she is a woman would be a cisgender woman. If your gender does conflict with your body, then you are transgender. Now remember, we use pronouns for gender. So someone who is who was born male but feels like they belong to the category of woman would be a transgender woman, and we would talk about her using she, her pronouns. Um, and so we have the idea that when you are born, a doctor has to figure out your biological sex. Right. So like when a baby is born, you check their body to see are they a boy or a girl, right? It's based on the body, but a human doctor has to determine which one. And humans can make mistakes. Many intersex people were assigned male at birth or assigned female at birth because the other set of body parts were harder to see. And so when the doctor sees one set, they think, oh, it's a boy. And then they write down boy and they don't see the female body parts. Um, so when we talk about transgender people, pronouns refer to their gender. Uh, but if you want to or if you have to talk about their biological sex or what the doctor wrote down when they were born, we use the terms assigned male at birth or assigned female at birth. So it's important to note that people can be transgender even if they don't change their bodies. Gender is only about how you feel you belong in society. So this line, regardless of gender confirmation procedures or surgeries, 
commonly known as a sex change. So yes, if a transgender person has had surgery to change their body to fit their gender, that should be easier to help you remember their gender. But if they have not had this surgery, um, they could still be transgender, right? They feel like their gender does not match their sex. Uh, so again, in English, when we use pronouns, pronouns refer to gender, not to the body. Uh, in fact, in some places, especially in the US, uh, it is now considered polite when you meet somebody, don't use he, she, or like he or she for that person until they themselves talk about them as a man, a woman, or something else. You don't want to assume their gender simply because of their body. Now, we, we've been talking about men and women. What about non-binary people uh, or otherwise called NBs, right? NB, they're NBs. Their pronoun is they, singular they. They usually is for plural, right? More than one person. But you can also use they for one person only. If they don't have a masculine or feminine gender, or you don't know their gender, you can use the word they, or you should use the word they. This looks, this may look kind of weird, but this use of they to refer to one person goes all the way back to Shakespeare. So it's less common, but it's not wrong. Now, NBs are in their own category because different NBs feel differently about their bodies. Some people, uh, some NBs do feel like um, their body matches or is close enough to their non-binary gender, so they don't feel like they're transgender. Other NBs feel like their bodies are in conflict with their non-binary gender, and they do feel like they're transgender. So it's hard to put NBs as a group into either cisgender or transgender. But the basic idea is just to respect each person's gender identity. Don't uh, try not to assume or force a gender onto somebody just by the way their body looks. And then finally, if you're not sure of your own gender or if you feel like you're in the middle, uh, if you're still figuring things out, uh, you feel like you don't belong to man, woman, cis, trans, or NB, you can just uh, call your, we can just think of you as queer or gender fluid or even gay. Gay doesn't just mean uh, you love somebody else of the same gender. Gay can now mean any kind of gender identity that it does not fall in the traditional uh, cisgender man and cisgender woman. And as for pronouns, use whatever pronouns you want. Other people should respect your pronouns. Questions so far? Okay, we have one more basic concept, which is sexual orientation. Se biological sex is your body, your gender is how you feel in society. Sexual orientation is what kind of people attract you, you feel desire for. Um, if you feel desire for people of the opposite gender, you are straight or heterosexual. If you feel desire for people of the same gender, you are gay or homosexual. But is it really that simple? At this point, I, I think you know it's not that simple. What about this? This is uh, a sexual orientation scale by the sexologist Dr. Kinsey. So it's called a Kinsey scale. On one side, exclusively straight. On the other side, exclusively gay. And in the middle are different degrees of straight or gay attraction. Does that cover everything? Not really. It's a bit more complicated than this. Uh, by the way, this is also what Freud believed in. He also thought of sexual orientation like this, but it's not that simple. 
Um, so in the Kinsey scale, some people are attracted to both sides. Those people we call bisexual, Shuangxingdian. So in this picture, they're in the middle between heterosexual and homosexual. But then there are people who don't feel a lot of sexual attraction to people. They can feel sexual desire, but it's not like when they see somebody really hot, they want to have sex with them. They don't have that urge. Or there are different degrees how strongly people feel that urge. Somebody who does not feel that urge at all is asexual. Now again, asexual people have functioning sexual bodies. They can have children. They, their body does everything that a body is supposed to do. But there is no direct connection between seeing somebody physically attractive and then having a body response. Right? Remember, sexual orientation is about being attracted by other people. Uh, it's not about one's body alone. So there are asexual people who are married and have children. Uh, and it's because their body responds to situations. Their body responds to what another person does to their body, but they don't. it doesn't go through the mind, right? It's only a body response. Is that the whole story? You can see the question mark, right? So it's, again, it's not that simple. Right. Here's a more complete picture. So uh, sexual attraction is body response, right? As I've been saying, when you see somebody hot and you feel desire, that's sexual attraction. And it could be for uh, feminine, or sorry, it could be for women, could be more for men, it could be somewhere in the middle. But then you also have attraction to gender characteristics. So sexual attraction is more about like the physical body. Gender characteristics, I know it says physical attraction. I couldn't change the picture. It, it's actually about how a person presents themselves. You know, some men seem more masculine than others. Some women seem more feminine than others. So when we talk about attraction, it's not just about body. It's also about presentation. And presentation is kind of like a, a signal for gender. Like usually, or not usually, but often, when you see a woman who does not present themselves very femininely, uh, it's likely that they don't feel a strong identification with the typical idea of a woman. Same for men. If you see a man who does not present himself very masculinely, it's it's possible that they do not have a strong identification with the idea of a typical man. So gender characteristics represent or can represent gender identity, and that's also another uh, dimension of attraction. So to biological sex, to gender, and then the z-axis, vertical, is about intensity. Right, so this would be like uh, related to whether someone is asexual or not. Um, I think in this graph, yeah, the higher the point is, the more strongly they feel sexual desire for other people. So, like the bottom level is asexual. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, uh, now. Sexual attraction and physical attraction. We can talk about these two a little in a little more detail. On the top is a, a sexuality or asexuality. We've already talked about this. Sexual desire for another person's 
uh, another person or another person's body. But then you also have romanticism or aromanticism. This is the feeling of being in love. Right, you can feel like you want to have sex with somebody without feeling in love with someone. So logically, the reverse is also true. You can feel in love with someone without wanting to have sex with them. So these are the two dimensions. Uh, and then this graph divides. Um, like a romanticism means you don't feel romantic feelings for other people, and there are different levels. So like. Uh, romance favorable is you don't often feel the romantic feelings, but you sometimes do, and you don't hate it, or you 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 it feels good. Romance indifferent is you sometimes feel it and you don't care. It's not good. It's not bad. It's whatever. Romance averse is uh, you don't like the feeling, and romance repulsed is you really hate the feeling of being in love with someone. Same for asexuality, right? You don't feel desire often for somebody else, but when you do, it's kind of nice. Uh, you, when you feel it, it's OK. You don't really care. When you feel desire, you don't like it. And then when you feel desire, it feels disgusting. Um, so just because somebody is asexual does not mean they can't love someone else. And just because somebody is aromantic does not mean they do not want to have sex with other people. It's two different concepts. Um, OK, so non binaries are called NBs. Asexual people are called aces. And aromantic people are called arrows. OK, so let's put together everything we've been talking about so far. This one. So you on the top you have gender identity, uh, and you have different scales for like it called it's called womanness and manness, but like femininity and masculinity. If you feel neither, you're agender. If you feel both, uh, you're either non-binary or pangender. And if you feel one or the other, you might be a man or a woman. Gender expression is like how you present yourself in society. Same thing. Biological sex. Uh, and then uh, sexual attraction and then romantic attraction. And you put all that together and you get a complete human being. Every one of us. Can be described in some way using this chart. Sometimes the value will change or you're not sure how much best describes you but we can conceptualize gender and sex and sexual orientation using this chart it can help us think about these ideas it can help us make sense of these ideas okay so that's the first main part basic concepts do you have questions OK, let's take a short break. Uh, I, I didn't hear the bell, but it is currently break time.
Okay, in the last hour, I introduced the course and we talked about sex, gender, and sexual orientation. Now let's talk about the different kinds of feminism. Fem feminism is usually divided into three waves. One comes after the other, but the division is not very strict. It's not like when the second wave starts, the first wave stops. Each wave keeps going as it is needed politically. And this is just a way to think about the different things that people have tried to fight for in terms of gender and sexual equality. So first wave feminism was born in the context where women were not considered human. In other, or they were considered incomplete humans. There were some things that people believed women could not do. Maybe they could not think as well as men. Maybe they could not uh, do some physical actions that men could do. So first wave feminism was very much focused on showing that women are also complete humans. Um, so the first point, right? Humanity, they are natural persons. They are born human just like men, uh, just because um, Eve was born after Adam, just because Eve ate the forbidden fruit before Adam, does not make Eve the lesser human, or does not make women the lesser human. And connected to that is the, the demonstration that women could do anything that men could. At the time, in a, f a few centuries ago, it was believed that um, teaching women, sending them to school was useless because they couldn't learn as well as men. They couldn't learn enough uh, to really benefit from that education. So in order to fight this stereotype, uh, some people and mothers started sending their daughters to school. And like, of course, as you would expect, there were very smart and talented women who had many great intellectual and literary achievements. But it was also the fight for legal rights. Uh, at the time, especially in the West, but in many countries, women were not considered legal persons. Women could not own property. They could not do business. They could not vote. For example, um, do you know when American women were finally allowed to get a credit card with their own name, and they didn't have to ask a husband or father for approval. Do you know when this happened? In the 1970s. So this is not, some of this is from the very far past, but the struggle for legal rights is ongoing. I think we can all agree with these ideas, right? There's no debate about this currently. Good. 
second wave feminism is about women as a social identity. The idea here is that society treats women as a group differently from how society treats men. Uh, and therefore, women have their own knowledge, experiences, and practices, things that they do that men do not or cannot understand. Now, this is history. I'm talking about history. I'm not saying that this is all correct. This is what second wave feminists believed. Or still believe in some cases. And the reason for this, the reason society treats women differently is because of ideology. Um, second wave feminists noticed that when we think about ideas, especially moral ideas, right or wrong, we often think in binaries, in twos, right? Right, wrong, light, dark, powerful, powerless, strong, weak, smart, stupid, right? always in twos. And for some reason, especially in Western societies, women were usually put on the worse one instead of the better one. So like, uh, according to stereotype, women were weak, but men were strong. Women were emotional, but men were rational. These kinds of ideas. Now, the thing about ideology, yi si xing tai, ideology is a kind of logic. It does not mean that everyone thinks about every woman this way. It means if you take a random person and you ask them about men and women, they will often think in this way. Um, but just because not everybody do thinks like this, uh, doesn't make it better, right? If the general idea, if the default idea is that women are in many ways worse than men, then all things being equal, women will have fewer chances to succeed in life, will have fewer chances at happiness or uh, making a, a good life for themselves. Um, now, it's also important to note that for some binary values, women were placed in the better position. But this is, this is also not always a good thing. For example, uh, one stereotype is men are cold and rational, but women are warm and emotional. Rational sounds good, but warm also sounds good. The idea is that women are naturally better at taking care of other people. That might sound good, right? But then what happens is people, especially men, will say, oh, you're a mother. You should stay home to take care of the children. Or if something happens at work and somebody gets hurt, people will expect a woman to come and take care of this person. Or you will have women nurses and women secretaries because these jobs help other people. So even for a good value like being caring and helpful in this kind of patriarchal ideology, right? Fu Chen de Yi Si Xing Tai, it still does not help women a lot. So for second wave feminists, the main idea is to fight against this kind of ideology either to try to change people's minds about thinking about women like this, or uh, feminist separatism or political lesbianism is an extreme position that says, you know what? All women should leave society and form their own society of women. If we can't change society, we will create a new society. Um, even if they don't actually go somewhere, uh, feminist separatists will try to live their lives excluding men. This is a more extreme position. Uh, and so if you don't have men in your life, then your physical desires and your romantic needs will have to be met 
with other women. So it's also called political lesbianism. A lesbian is a woman who loves a woman. So like for these, uh, this group of feminist separatists, when they have a, a romantic or physical relationship with a woman, it's not always because they're gay, it's sometimes because they prefer a woman over a man for political reasons. Uh, and then even more extreme are TERFs. If we think about men and women using binary values, and if second wave feminists try to promote women over men or even try to exclude men, what about everyone else? We just talked about men, women, and everybody else. So what about everybody else? Some second wave feminists think that they should be treated like men. So we also exclude everybody else. These are trans exclusionary radical feminists, also known as TERFs, T E R F. The idea here is that these people believe when someone assigned male at birth says that they are a transgender woman, they're actually a man trying to enter women's spaces and women's lives for some evil purpose. Now, if you only stop there, it could kind of make sense. But, you know, in our society today, if you look like a man and you say you're a woman, many people will have strange thoughts about you. Many people will um, laugh at you or think you're weird, don't want to interact with you. Your life will become harder. So if you think about the whole picture, if a man does pretend to be a woman simply to gain access to women's spaces, how much do they have to suffer in daily life versus what actual benefits do they get? The math doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense. For TERFs, the reverse is also bad. Like if someone is born a woman, and they say that they're actually a man, TERFs will say that this person is actually a woman who doesn't want to suffer like all the other women. They would rather get the benefits of being a man. But again, if you look at the whole picture, women, sorry, people who were born women, assigned female at birth, and then later come out as transgender men, also have a hard time in groups of other men. If you've ever hung out with a group of guys, you know that it's a very special atmosphere, right? It's not just like everybody is very polite and open. There's a lot of like competition. There are a lot of unspoken agreements, more chi, going on in that group. For trans people, if uh, someone assigned female at birth comes out as a man, you know, before they come out, they have been raised as a woman. All of they, what they learned about how to be a human being, they have been learning how to be a woman. So if they decide to come out as a man, they have to relearn how to be a man from the beginning. Not just how to talk and uh, how, like how to dress, but also simple things. Uh, how to walk in a more masculine way. Or like how to look at people in a more masculine way. Have you ever thought about how your gender influences your actions? Probably not. But if you're transgender and you want to live the rest of your life as the gender that you feel, it's a whole learning process. So yes, if someone assigned female at birth comes out as a man, and after a long and hard period of learning and bullying and feeling excluded, they finally manage to convince cis men that they're also a man, they might get some benefits of that. But again, is it worth it? 
when you look at the math, would a rational person actually go through this long process just to get some kind of benefit? It doesn't make sense. So turfism is not an accurate picture of transgender people. It's simply uh, a logical corollary of second wave feminism. If you truly believe that society works in binary values and looks at men one way, women another way, and that's it, then this is the only logical way you can make sense of transgender people. So in fact, the existence of transgender people is, it shows you the limitations of second wave feminism. Back when sexual discrimination was common and accepted, second wave feminism was very important. Back when men could talk about women as like more stupid and weaker and whatever, and people would generally agree, second wave feminism was very important in changing people's ideas. But when you reach a point where most people agree that you should treat women exactly the same or similar as how do you treat men, then being too extreme about second wave feminism could cause some problems. And that brings us to third wave feminism. The basic idea of third wave feminism is that you should not try to force people into different gender categories. A person's gender is not really important to how much you respect them or what kind of political rights or benefits that they get. Now, this is not saying that all genders are exactly the same. Different people will have different situations that you should respect. So it's not everybody is the same. In fact, it is everybody is different. So one way of, we call this exploding the gender binary. It's not just two, it's more than two. One way to do this is to look at other kinds of identity. And this is called intersectionality because different identities intersect in each individual person. So you can look at gender, sexual orientation, race, class, ability or disability, senzang, age, uh, and other kinds of identity. So for example, I am a straight, cisgender, Asian, male from the upper middle class, and I have a disability, and I'm in middle age. Age is also part of this, right? We think of young people differently from how we think of old people. If I say, oh, I have a friend and they are 75 years old, you immediately imagine somebody who doesn't exercise a lot, who speaks slowly, who goes to bed early, right? Age influences how we think about somebody. Um, so like each person will have a different point of intersection among different identities. So if you look at each person like this, literally every person is different. It's really hard to say you should treat all women like this or you should treat all men like this. And that brings us to the second point. If you do try to focus on the idea of a man or the idea of a woman, you're going to hurt a lot of people. Uh, the basic example here is um, We've been talking about stereotypes of women, right? Women are more caring, therefore they should be stay-at-home mothers. But there are also stereotypes about men, right? Men are stronger, they are more rational. So when bad things happen, they shouldn't cry. They should try to hard, uh, work hard to fix the problem. But thinking like this means that you don't think men have emotions that they have to deal with is the classic example. But there are many different things too, right? So like uh, one stereotype is 
men are more ambitious than women. They want more from their jobs and careers. But of course, not every man is ambitious. Some men just want a good, secure job and just keep it for the rest of their life. They don't want to be the best. They don't want to be president. They just want to be able to live their lives. So if you think that men should be ambitious and you have a friend who is a man and is not ambitious, you might not respect him because he doesn't fit your idea of what a good man should be or do. So gender stereotypes and patriarchal ideology doesn't just hurt women, it also hurts men. Um, the, there's a, a simple mental picture that can help you with this. If the ideology puts some people higher than other people, on a pyramid, there is less space at the top. So like, if your identity gives you more advantages in this society, it's also harder for any person to fit that identity because there's less space at the top. For example, um, if we talk about powerful men, uh, we think of stereotypical ideas like ambitious, strong, driven, talented, wealthy, right? But the more words you use, the fewer men will fit everything. So even though in a patriarchy, in general, men are treated better than women, if you truly believe the entire ideology, most men will not fit that ideal either. Like believing in any kind of power hierarchy ideology hurts everyone not just the uh, lower level people. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. And like this is a basic idea of third wave feminism. So instead of any kind of ideology, they promote the idea that you should respect everybody uh, for each person's unique identity and situation. And so third wave feminism also brings in queer activism. Um, there's a separate history of the fight for gay rights, but uh, the idea of queerness isn't just about gay people. The idea of queerness is that um, in traditional ideas, it's hard to fit gay people into traditional ideas of relationships and family and marriage. So the idea of queer isn't just about being gay, it's about being outside of those traditional ideas. And so queer activism is promoting the idea that we should celebrate all different kinds of genders and bodies and sexual desires, and that nothing about this is shameful. Now, this is the general idea, but currently in society, there are still a few kinds of sexual desires that most people think is probably not a good idea. For example, uh, having sex with animals, having sex with children, having sex with family members are not accepted by most people in society. So this is a general idea. We should try to respect uh, people's diverse identities and desires, but that doesn't mean that we should accept every desire, right? Everybody has a moral compass. We all have a feeling of what is right and what is wrong. Um, queer activism is saying we should try to expand our idea of what should be accepted. And so queer activism doesn't use fixed categories. Like in the last hour, I gave all different kinds of complicated charts and graphs to try to describe how people think about sex and gender and sexual orientation. 
but those ideas could change. Those ideas could become even more complicated. Queer activists remind us, don't limit yourself to today's ideas. When things change, be open to change, especially in terms of human beings and their desires and their identities. So do you have questions about feminism? As you can see, it's called feminism, but it's not just about women, right? It's about men. It's also about everybody else. All right, if not, let's move into the third main point, which is how do we connect all of those ideas to movies? Uh, and the key, the first key to start with is how do we watch a film? Um, and not just movies, right? TV, how do we read a book? When you hear a story, how do we look at it? There are two main strategies. One is representation, which means the story, the film, gives you a world and people and situations that maybe could or could not happen in real life. The situation, maybe not, but the people, often you could meet this kind of person in real life. And so viewing a film through the strategy of representation is kind of saying like, is this a good person? Do I want to be like this person? Does this person's identity represent me? It's thinking about whether this story reflects real life or maybe reflects an ideal version of real life. Uh, and so when you hear like, oh, this is the first uh, female superhero, or like this is the first black superhero, this is the kind of strategy that they're talking about. It's, it's the idea that when a young girl sees that Captain Marvel is a woman, or when a young black kid sees that Black Panther is black, they also feel like the culture welcomes them. It's possible for them to have their own superheroes also. They don't always have to only watch like straight white male superheroes. So that's the idea of visibility. It, uh, role models, identification, it's saying, do I want to be like that person? Is this person a good example for me? This kind of viewing is a more passive viewing. You're taking this story and this movie and you're comparing it to your own life, which is what we usually do for most situations. When you hear about something, you think, oh, could that happen to me? Or what would I do if that happened to me? It's a more direct instinct. So I call it a more passive kind of viewing. The other main viewing strategy is critique. And this is when the story or the film is not connected to you, but you are thinking about whether this situation is right or wrong. Are these people good people or bad people? What's going on in this story? What is the logic story? If it's trying to tell me something, what is it trying to tell me? So the first strategy is you're putting yourself in that world. The second strategy, critique, is you are evaluating that world separate from yourself. Does this story make sense? How does this story make sense? And usually, critique will therefore focus on uh, the negative aspects of the story that maybe you have noticed in real life, or maybe you have not noticed in real life. Sometimes after watching a movie and thinking about its logic, you leave the room, you go back to your life, and you realize, wait, those things in the movie are also happening in my life as well. How have I never noticed before? And it's because critique is an active kind of viewing. You are actively using your mind to make sense of that story. And if you make sense of this story, 
you might also be able to make sense of your own story. So again, you yourself are separate from the film that you're watching. And so critique would include uh, thinking about whether the story is a kind of allegory. So like um, the main character is actually representing. Uh, oh, how do I say this? The main character is actually representing a working woman, a woman who has a job. And so things that happen to this woman are representative of things that happen to women who work uh, every day. They are typical situations. So the point of an allegory is not about the specific character. It is about the kind of person that this character is. Um, allegories are often uh, connected to fables, right? Aesop's fables. When Aesop tells you a story about a fox and a hedgehog or like a scorpion and a frog, it's not actually about animals, right? It's about different kinds of people. That is an allegory. It could also be a satire. It's ironic. This story is exaggerated to make you see something ridiculous or absurd that maybe you have not noticed before. So, like, for example, uh, being a college student, some things just don't make sense. Right, like, why is our course selection system like this? Why, when I need this class, I can't get into this class? Why, when this teacher is so great, does he not have enough students? Right, some things don't make sense. A satire would be a story that makes these points really big and really obvious to show the viewer, hey, these things don't make sense. We should try to fix them. And so when you're watching a movie using the strategy of critique, you will be making moral judgments. Is this really the right thing? Or is this something wrong? Should this be fixed? Uh, how does this make sense? And do I want to live in this kind of world? So the difference between representation and critique, I have a very good example for this. Do you guys know the film The Wolf of Wall Street? The story of a cheater who got really rich by selling fake stocks. And then he got caught. But because he's very rich, he didn't really suffer in prison. And after he got out of prison, he became a motivational speaker. He went around telling people to pursue their dreams because I got my dreams, so can you. The movie is full of all of the different silly, stupid, but also fun and exciting things that the main character did on his journey of cheating other people's money. All kinds of drugs and parties and lots of money and beautiful women. So most people, when they saw this film, thought that it was a satire and a moral judgment of this kind of person the kind of person who thinks that getting rich is the most important thing, more important than doing the right thing, more important than not hurting other people. So most people watch this movie using the strategy of critique. The crazier the parties, the hotter the women, the more terrible we thought the main character was because he was doing all of that with other people's stolen money. But some people watch the view uh, the film through the strategy of representation. And whenever the main character had a good time, they also felt like, yeah, party, man. And they thought it was an exciting lifestyle that they also wanted to have. Most of those people were stock traders on Wall Street. There was a story of somebody who went to a movie theater near Wall Street and watched the film with a lot of stock traders and people working on Wall Street. And most of the people in that theater thought that the main character was a hero and they wanted to be just like him, except they didn't want to be caught. 
So that's the main difference between critique and representation. Does that help? OK. So when we're watching films in this class, you can think about both strategies. Does the film present people that I want to be like? Does it present a world that I, wa I want to, be, to uh, live in? Or is it giving me a story that tells me this is bad and this is good and that I can try to make sense of the logic of what's going on? Now, when we watch movies, we, sh we should focus on the story and the characters, but there are so many other things we can think about. A movie is a work of art. Some movies are really bad works of art, but they are all works of art. Every work of art is the result of human choices. Maybe the director made some choices. Maybe the writer made some choices or the actors, maybe the camera person. But everything you see is the result of human choices. So we can think about everything and see if they make sense together or how they make sense together. What are these elements trying to get us to think or to feel? So let's go through this list very quickly. Um, acting, everything related to the characters, from uh, who the actors are. Like if you choose one actor instead of another actor, it's because they are connected with different ideas, right? For example, if the main character is played by Anne Hathaway, it would be di very different than if she were played by Meryl Streep. So the person you choose also has an influence. But also, what does their face look like, their makeup? What does their hair look like? What clothing are they wearing? How do they talk? Uh, what is their accent like? Where are they from? What kind of personality is this character? Are all things we can think about. Cinematography is everything related to the actual picture, the image. So uh, how bright or dark is it? What color is it? How fine are the details? Like, can you see a lot of like indistinct, blurry, fuzzy things? Or is everything very sharp and very in focus? Uh, and also, where does the image, uh, like what angle does the image use? Are you getting the whole picture? Are you getting part of the picture? Are you getting the picture from one person's side? And does the image move? If it moves, how does it move? Up, down, left, right, in, out, circle, above, far away? All of these are choices that we can think about. Directing. Okay, this is a bit harder, but a director's job is to make sure that the whole movie feels right. What does that mean, feel right? According to what the director wants. So the director is kind of like the main artistic inspiration. They have an idea or a feeling, and they want to turn that into a movie. And so every part of the movie should feel like that or should express that idea. So in other words, does the movie feel like one complete movie? Sometimes it's not that easy. Some movies, yeah, that's a great movie. It fits together perfectly. End of story. But other movies, sometimes it doesn't quite make sense. But then you look at it from this way, you look at it from that way, and at, suddenly you see how everything fits together. That is the job of the director. And so you can talk about that uh, a movie's quality in terms of its directing. Editing. Editing is the connection between images. So an image might be static, it might be moving, but when this image ends and we cut 
to the next image that is editing. So some basic questions. Where does the shot begin? Where does the shot end? What are we missing from before the beginning? And what are we missing from after the end? You know, life doesn't have shots, right? It's one continuous moment from when we wake up to when we fall asleep. But movies have cuts. Something has to be skipped. What are we skipping? Why are we skipping it? Also, when you switch from one shot to another or one scene to another, how? Is it just a direct cut? Or does it like fade away and then fade back in? Does the image use like a wall? And when you go from this side of the wall to the other side of the wall, it's actually a different situation? How do we get from one shot to the other shot and why? Now, in included in editing is if we don't have a cut, if we're watching something really boring and we don't skip anything, that is also editing. Why? What is the reason the film does not skip the boring parts? Production design. This is everything related to uh, every everything visual that is not related to the actor. So this is the setting. What do you see in the space, in the environment? If it's indoors, what kind of building is it? What kind of room is it? What are what objects are in this room? What kind of tables and chairs does this character have? Um, like, how is the room designed? What about the wallpaper? What about the ceiling? And always we can think, what are these designs trying to tell us? If the space is a personal room, then these designs probably tell us something about the owner of the room. If it's someplace at work, the design might tell us how people feel about their job, right? If it's outdoors, where is it? What season? What weather? How is the light like? Are there uh, elements of nature? Uh, and always why? Why this place? Why this time? Why this weather? Next is score. Score just means music. What kind of music is being used in this film? Why at this moment do we suddenly hear music? What kind of music is it? What kind of feeling are we supposed to get from it? What is the music trying to do? What is it trying to tell us? Some movies have no music. We can also think, why? Why no music? Script. Script is the writing. What do the characters say? Uh, how do the lines fit together? What is the structure of the story? What is the story itself trying to say or trying to do to us? Sound effects. You know, when you watch a movie and somebody opens a door, that's not actually how doors sound in real life. You know this, right? When you watch a movie and somebody is walking across a wooden floor, that's not how it really sounds in real life. When you watch a movie and there's a horse walking by, that's not how a horse sounds in real life. The best example, haha, if you punch somebody, what sound does that make? Does that make that sound? No, no, that's only in, on movies and TV. If you punch somebody, it doesn't make a sound, right? Your body is soft. The skin is soft. The other person's skin is also soft. There's basically no sound. The punching sound is added in. That's a sound effect. Most sounds in movies are added later. Even sounds that you think are like very basic. For example, this morning, I was watching a TV show, and one character gave another character a business card. They didn't take it out of their wallet. They didn't take it out of their pocket. 
after a cut, they just suddenly had it in their hand and they handed it to another character. What sound does this motion make? No sound. But on the soundtrack, I heard, right, the sound of paper. That's an added sound effect. And most of the time, you don't even notice because the point of sound effects is not to make it sound like real life. Sound effects are to guide your attention. If you hear a sound, you will pay more attention to that thing. So what actions have sound effects? What does it sound like? Why does it sound like that? Stunts and special effects. These are special situations that happen for real, and then the camera records them, like stunts, taji, right? Fighting in movies. They actually do the actions. They don't really hurt a, a, another person, but their body does do the action, and then the camera records it. So you can think about how do they do this? Why do they do this? What parts of these special actions are we supposed to focus on? For example, a car crash. They get two real cars and they really like bump them together. But there are different kinds of car crashes, right? In one kind, maybe there's broken glass everywhere. Or maybe one car flips over. Or maybe something goes flying out the window. Or maybe there's a huge explosion. Same car crash, different things to focus on. Why? What does the movie want us to get? And then finally, visual effects in animation. These are what you do to a movie after the camera has recorded it. So special effects happen in real life and you, you record it. Visual effects are you take the movie, put it in a computer, and you add stuff to it or sometimes you take things away. Those are visual effects. Animation is just cartoons. Uh, although I guess today with CGI, every movie is an animation, right? Um, so again, what are being added? What are being taken away and why? So we can think about all of these film elements when we watch a movie. And we can think about how they are related to sex, gender, and sexual orientation. Now, in terms of uh, gender and film, one particular concept we can focus on is the idea of the gaze. Gaze means to look at. It, it means a perspective, some kind of angle. So, of course, the director will have his own perspective, his or her own perspective. But also the writer and also the camera person. The director cannot make every single decision. Sometimes somebody else makes the decision and the director says, OK, fine, sure, that works. So it's not just the director, one person only. Everybody related to making the movie has some influence on the perspective of the film. But then you also have the perspective of the viewer. We were talking about representation or critique. Which one does the movie want you to do? For example, the Barbie movie. A lot of women went to watch the Barbie movie and said, oh, that's such a great movie. I want the world to be like that. Because the movie is trying to make women agree with it. Of course, not all women, right? Some women also thought it was a terrible movie. Um, and some men thought it was a great movie. But the idea is each movie has a designed target audience. And so finally, the actual audience. How do we actually think about a movie? Representation or critique? And then the last concept I have two minutes to explain to you is very hard to explain. The idea of camp comes from queer theory. It's a way of looking at a movie that it's like a different way of thinking, is it good or bad? So we have, we know we have good movies, we have bad movies, and then we have movies that are so bad that they're good. 
camp is something different. Uh, and so according to this scholar, camp has four basic elements. Irony, whatever you see on screen, it's probably a joke. Aestheticism, there's a lot of attention to making things colorful and beautiful, even if it doesn't make sense in the movie. Theatricality, which means performance. Of course, the actors are performing, but in turn, if a movie is campy, often you know that they're performing. It feels like they are performing. It doesn't feel like they are trying to be real people. It feels like they are trying to make you see their performance. It's very exaggerated, very unrealistic. And then the fourth one, bitter humor. The idea that a lot of the jokes in the movie uh, are about a kind of situation in reality that uh, taken seriously is a pretty bad situation. And this is where we can see the source of this concept from queer theory. Throughout history, many gay people have suffered uh, social discrimination and worse, like murder. So when gay people made movies, many of them made movies about their own suffering experiences and circumstances. But if it's all suffering all the time, it can get really hard to watch. So many filmmakers tried to turn these terrible situations into something that they can laugh at, something that they can deal with using humor. So bitter humor is also an element of a campy film. Now, this is not an easy idea to understand. A lot of campy movies, you watch them, they feel like bad movies. But if you think about them using these four elements, they can start to make more sense. So you can keep these ideas in mind if a movie seems bad and you don't know why. Okay, that's it. Questions? All right, next week, come here. We're going to watch a movie. Uh, and if we make it to week three, I will discuss the movie with you. Okay, see you next week.